All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's rainy, summery June Monday. <laughs> Last week of June, if you can believe it, I honestly cannot. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I'm just gonna adjust some settings here. All right, uh, Cynthia, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen, please? Thank you so much. All right, so Vision Zero Implementation Subcommittee for June 26. Uh, for those of you who are new, um, which there are not, I'm still gonna go through the formality. Things to know the video um, feature is turned on for our <laughs> participants, uh, our panelists, but not for participants. You can always leave and rejoin if you're having audio issues, communicate through the Q&A feature, uh, and there will be an opportunity for public comment. And all of our meeting materials can be found online. Technology questions. I don't think anyone is joining us via phone, so I'm just going to move beyond this slide. And just our, I will take a moment to go over our meeting norms. Um, Commit to learning, avoid speculation, let's treat each other with kindness, decency, and respect. And yeah, I think we'll be good to go. You all should have received uh, via email a couple attachments for tonight's meeting, one being the slide deck, two being a PDF with some memos, and a third item would have been an Excel spreadsheet uh, that we'll also be discussing this evening. So with that, we'll move into introductions. Uh, I will begin uh, and we'll do popcorn. So please, you know, name the next person that you're going to have introduce themselves. Suzanne Flowers, transportation planner for the city of Ann Arbor. Lillian. Good evening, everyone. Lillian Webb with the Get Downtown program. Uh, Seth. You are muted, Seth. Sorry, I pushed the space bar, but I guess I wasn't in the right window. <laughs> My name is Seth Peterson. I'm with Walk Bike Washington. And Cynthia. Good evening, everyone. I'm Cynthia Redinger. I am one of our transportation engineers here at the city of Ann Arbor. And I will pass over to Brett. Uh, hello, Brett Hadamaki. I'm on the uh, Transportation Commission. I'll pass it to Julie. Hi, Julie Boland. I'm also on the Transportation Commission. And Jonathan. Jonathan Levine, faculty in urban and regional planning at the University of Michigan. Well, thanks everybody for being here. So we have a couple things to update you this evening and my apologies, I am gonna go between a couple different tabs at the top of your screen. So just as a quick review, we'll do our Vision Zero program updates first. We'll look at our maintenance of traffic memo. We'll look at the project prioritization memo and our strategy tracking. Are there any questions about those items to begin with? Seeing none, we'll jump in. I am going to scroll back up, so avert your eyes for just a moment. All right, uh, maintenance of traffic memo. I actually think we may have brought this forward um, in the past, but I wanted to make sure that everyone saw the final version that was developed by Sam Schwartz. And I'll just take a few minutes to kind of go over some of the main components. We're really looking at the maintenance of traffic from a much more holistic standpoint from a safe systems approach. We currently do have maintenance of traffic as part of our active construction projects. But what Sam Schwartz was able to do is look at maybe some of those gaps and holes that we really need to backfill and provide some additional guidance, uh, education and training and put forth as part of this Vision Zero effort. Oh yeah, sorry. Just a quick question. So the two uh, lines says City of Ann Arbor. Who did this go to? 
like who did this memo go to? Yeah. Oh, our team and then you guys, okay. uh, the Vision Zero Implementation Committee. And then I, I expect that we will, if Transportation Commission would like a presentation on that, uh, Raymond or Cynthia or whomever staffs that could adequately discuss this memo as well. So I guess what, I was thinking about who's going to be implementing it. Oh, um, you're looking at her. Okay. <laughs> that would be Cynthia and I. So there are some components like later on in the memo that kind of address that. Okay. Um, so I reviewed this memo with some of our right-of-way inspectors and had gotten some feedback from them to provide to Sam Schwartz as well. And they said, you know, this is great but it's not really what they need in order to like get in the hands of, you know, contractors. So one of the things that we want to do, if you will allow for some quick scrolling, is we need to develop kind of like a, a really quick guide that is very picture heavy, user friendly, and that we can actually hand out um, to contractors. And that was the recommendation from our right of way inspectors. So based on the information that they provide, I'm sorry for the, the quick scrolling. One of the things that we wanna do is update our orange book, which is where all of our, and Cynthia, you can help me, I've never used the orange book a day in my life, um, but all of the guidance on our best practices <laughs> would be, and this would be either an addendum to or in addition within that guidance book. And then we'd have something separate that I could give and create for our right of way people to hand out to the contractors directly in the field. Yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering. Okay. Thanks, that's really helpful. And yeah, and Julie, I think the the most appropriate thing is that it'll it will be added as an addendum to the orange book, which is our engineering standards. Um, and that way, those items will be required for. Uh, internal or external work that happens in our right of way. So I'll just pause for a moment. I don't want to, I don't have to belabor the point of that. Like a lot of this is going to fall on, you know, our team to ensure that we have effective implementation as outlined here, making sure that we have it incorporated in the orange book, that we incorporate wherever new requirements need to be and then actually do training with our right-of-way inspectors to make sure that they know that this is a tool that they don't have to do anything. All they have to do is just like grab it from the back table. So that is a, a function that I really will be taking on um, once this contract is kind of wrapped up. And then there'll be the compliance piece as well. But oh, Lillian? Yeah, not knowing a lot about um the process that uh, the city generally uses for um, kind of road construction. I am curious, um, does the orange book, do folks generally reference it even before going to um, getting awarded the contract? I, I've just seen some times where it kind of seems like, uh, like a ramp is more of an afterthought and you've got this great picture of a ramp that's like actually like, usable versus like oh yeah let's put down some kind of like uneven um you know extra asphalt pavement that we have so i'm just wondering if you know if if, if there's opportunities for people to plan this into what they're going to do versus kind of oh yeah now we need to do this let's scramble and make it happen well lillian i think part of what you're referring to is really what happens um when a ramp has been disturbed and it's a, a temporary patch until the final product can can be installed. So quite often you'll find this with like utility projects where the utilities have a project such as DTE is um, working on gas main leads and they go down the street and you have a whole series of holes that have been punched either into the street or into the sidewalk and uh, another example especially of the concerns with the ramps those were um you know we had a, a a lot of the communications that the it department was doing where they were punching holes in sidewalk all over the place running the the fiber optics and so 
that's that's one of those temporary situations that we we need to get um, we need to get a little bit more of a handle over because theoretically that that temporary restoration should be adequate if you're putting back um, an HMA substance into into those holes but if it's not properly compacted and it's not properly filled then you're not going to have a nice solid stable surface to to be to be walking on and how long can a patch stay in place right like we've had some instances where we've had patches in places for a year and that's something that oh Larry, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that you had been, we'll get you promoted to a panelist. Larry is on the, Larry, I'm sorry, Suzanne, should Larry be a panelist? I can't remember. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, so that, yes, it gets covered in here, um, but I guess that is a little different than route planning. Did I answer your question at all? Or did I just ramble? You you did answer my question. There is more information in there, but you answered my question. Okay. Uh, just real and quick. I, oh, sorry. I wanted to make sure that Larry had a chance to introduce himself yes. to everyone as well. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, Larry Deck, I'm on the uh, board of uh, Walk Bike Washtenaw. Larry, did you have a question or were you just trying to get my attention that you were in the room? Yeah, the latter. Fair. Well, thank you, Cynthia. And I just wondered if you could maybe provide a little bit of context for everyone on the call this evening on kind of what we currently do for maintenance of traffic when it comes to pedestrians and cyclists. What is, you know, either state guidance, best practice, and how this may kind of tee in and support those existing efforts. Yeah, I am going to start a little broad and then narrow in uh, a little bit with this memo. The Federal Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the Michigan Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices does require maintenance of traffic for all modes of travel. But neither of those documents provides really good direction on how to do um, how to go about doing that maintenance of traffic. And what we wanted to accomplish was with this memo was to specifically just build out a little bit um, what, what we can provide to our internal engineers, to our consulting engineers, to private developers, and to anyone who's doing work within the right of way under a permit to really just expand upon that really basic guidance that's in the Michigan Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And we were specifically asked by our right-of-way inspectors to make sure that we were including bicycling and bicycling infrastructure in the document that we were putting together because they get a lot of resistance, particularly from some of the permit work that happens. Um, I, I believe that frequently it's utilities and utility contractors because there isn't a standard plan that is in the manual. So they don't want to provide something because there isn't a picture for it. So this, uh, this document really does lay out a lot of design principles as far as how maintenance of traffic for modes other than vehicles should be accommodated, designed for, implemented. And one, as Suzanne said earlier, one of the bits of feedback that we did receive from our right-of-way inspectors was that they would like to have some standard plans. So while this document really lays out the, we expect these things from anyone who's working in our right-of-way, um, we are going to need to take that next step and put together some standard plans so that we can also say, this is what we would like you to do and this is what it should look like.
And I think the memo does a really nice job of kind of highlighting these three main areas, the main principles to maintain access. And there is a heavy influence on the non um, And really, you know, access for people with disabilities as well, making sure that we have, you know, non-trip hazards, clear uh, audible warnings, uh, you know, that's good practice for everyone, but especially for our disability community. Um, and so I will, like I said, there's the education section on things that we're going to be doing internal, making sure that we have compliance and this will take, you know, time to make sure that all of our inspectors are up to speed on this information, making sure that we're work with, working with them and those kind of handheld deliverables and then making sure that we do enforce that. Um, we do have a, a checklist as part of this <clears throat> that we can use when we're doing reviews. And again, Cynthia, please jump in um, if I misspeak in any way on this. This is just a great way for us to ensure that we're not missing some of the most obvious areas that we can use to help build the, anything further into the future. And I will pause for, oh, questions, yes. I was just curious about the audible warning, like for the blind, is it more than just a bonk, bonk? Is it like road closed ahead, like actual words or what sort of warning is it? And Cynthia, I would turn to you as our resident engineer. <laughs> yeah, so there, there are commercially available devices that would give a verbal description of a, a work zone and what what action needs to be taken to participate in the detour. It's something, uh, standard plans that we have, that we incorporate in all of our projects um, for pedestrian and temporary pedestrian access routes include where an audible device would go. We haven't had a request for an audible device yet. So we haven't included them in any of our actual construction, but we do have, um, we have we have it laid out where it would go if we did get the request to have that installed. So request, you mean like from a blind person? Yes. But how would they know to request it? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, when, when someone wants something, they're usually pretty good at calling. We, we do get, I mean, realistically, because they are a segment of the population who's used to asking for what they want. And if they're, if we received a call and someone told us that, hey, I use this area, I use this area all the time. I want to know what your work zone is going to be like. If we knew that we were going to be changing the work zone frequently, then that's something that we would, I, I think, definitely be including. Um, but like I said, at this point, it's it has not been included in any of our projects. Thanks. Are there any other questions on the MOT memo? All right. Well, I'm gonna move on to the project prioritization memo, again, also included in your packet. And this one I actually do think we have seen, but wanted to take a few minutes to review this. Um, the capital project selection, there was a lot of projects that were brought forward. They looked at our existing CIP and projects that were kind of through their methodology um, advanced as well. And they decided to narrow down the most near term projects. And that is kind of what you start to see in the tables that will be coming up. So the priority elements were based on the items in front of you tier one, the, our highest tier corridors and intersections, pedestrian crossings, and bike routing. The elements in waiting were weighed in on by this subcommittee body and were applied to those projects to come up with this like top 20 
um, near-term projects that they are prioritizing that they believe are the most near-term and the most significant projects that we should be focusing on. So these are, this is the list of these near-term corridors. There are 23 of them. And then there is a map that follows. Sorry for the little tab. <laughs> and they just outline um, the different features of those projects and what may need to be altered in our capital improvement program. And so as the categories forward, they discuss what this current CIP project is, the CIP name, and then potential adjustments that we may need to make within that programming element. And I think one thing that Cynthia wanted to make sure that I pointed out is these projects are not like replacing our, you know, CIP function in any way. It's going to be working in partnership with that. And there may be, uh, there will be adjustments that we'll be looking to make within our existing CIP now that we have this memo finalized, such as adjusting the funding, um, ex, you know, changing the extents of the specific project and really starting to build the capacity within the programming of all of these high priority projects um, in that part of the planning process. And Cynthia, would you add anything as I'm kind of continuing to go through some of the modifications that may need to be made in the CIP? I think you covered it really well. Um... As Suzanne said, we have been updating and modifying the scopes of the projects that are currently in the CIP. The approach to scoping out projects as we're moving forward will definitely be changing a bit. And, you know, really also that partnership with um, the funds that are available in the CIP because you have project specific elements in the CIP and then you also have projects that are listed and are really more like a, a bucket of funding. So major streets, uh, major street crossings, you know, pedestrian crossings is an example. And this process is going to help us as a team internally prioritize how we're spending those funds as well. And I would be remiss because I'm a pragmatist to say that while these may be the most important 23 projects that we want to see advanced, um, they are competing for funds, period. Um, you know, prices we have seen really increase dramatically. Um, and we want to make sure that elements that are called out, especially in these 23 projects, are not cut. You know, if we really need to have a sidewalk gap and fill, cutting that is just not, it's not good practice. We don't want to be kind of skimping on those things that are heavily safety focused. And so that's why we may have to, you know, take a segment at a time. And that may take longer than what, you know, we would really like to see based on come up some of our project tracking and our really targets overall with the plan. Um, but we know we just don't have a money tree in the backyard at City Hall. It would be great if we did. Uh, I think it would solve a lot of problems, but <laughs> we don't have that. So we will, uh, you know, we'll be putting forth the same arguments and efforts going through all the processes as we do with the, the CIP programming and working with administration, uh, the, the budgeting priorities as well. So I'd just like to pause for a moment and take any questions um, and hopefully we can address them. It is a lot to digest, <laughs> but it is a lot of adjustment administratively, I believe on our end to make sure that this reflects accurately the, the work that Sam Schwartz put into the Vision Zero implementation contract, and that we put those into the CIP programming, which I believe will be done this fall. I've already talked to Caleb Coleman, who is our CIP programmer, 
and shared uh, the draft memo with her so that she knows that there will be some fairly substantial changes that we want to make sure are incorporated in this season. Well, not hearing any questions, I am going to move over to our project tracking spreadsheet. <clears throat> I know, Jonathan, you did have a, a question that you had emailed, so I want to make sure that we provide a little time for you to ask that of everybody in the forum today. But really, this is this is the the strategies and the targets that are found at the back of the plan that I will be using to kind of track our progress. Um, we'll be kind of reporting some of that out annually in our annual report. And then looking at, they have kind of, uh, Sam Schwartz has kind of subdivided everything into kind of capital improvement areas, analysis and evaluation, policies and programs, and then strategies that they really outline for other organizations to fulfill but in partnership with the vision of the plan. And so Jonathan, I just wanted to provide you an opportunity to bring your question forward and we can discuss. Sure, thank you, Suzanne. <clears throat> so I was lining up these uh, targets with the, uh, with the goals set by the Moving Together plan when it comes to the bicycle network. Uh, the targets that I found were in the plan were install or upgrade five miles of new low stress bike routes each year and complete the full ages and abilities bike network by 2035. So I wanted to make sure that our that our targets align with the targets of the plan. I'm not sure that they do because the, the targets that I was able to find in this spreadsheet, it, one was install bike markings uh, and infrastructure where they're planned, etc. cetera, uh, during other construction projects. Um, uh, oh, let's see, I, I listed that twice. <laughs> so it seems to me that if we're going to, if we're going to line, if we're going to line it up, I think, first of all, we need to commit to, um, specifically to a certain number. And if we're going to be aligned with the plan, it's five miles per year of new low stress routes. Uh, and then, uh, targeting five miles per year, not three because I think we saw three miles per year in in the spreadsheet. And then uh, monitorable targets for the development of the full network. So the full network is is there, uh, is represented on the plan. It's, obviously, it's a very, very ambitious goal, uh, page 62 of the plan. Um, and and I think by, th by 2035 is the commitment of the plan. So how I, I'd like to know whether or not we are or are not on track to that goal by divvying up the full network uh, by the number of years between now and 2035, which is, what is it, 12 years. Um, and that would assist us in knowing that we're on track. So anyway, the, the, that's, a lo the long, that's a long version. The short version is I'd like to ensure that our that our targets align with the goals set out in the plan. So I, in my, my opinion is, um, you know, we, we know the end target, the end goal is, and I just caution a little bit about trying to um, establish a, you know, an annual plan. Um, you know, these things tend to go like, like with anything, they go in fits and starts. Sometimes you get a situation where, um, you know, it takes, you get 90% of the work done with 10% of the effort, and then the last bit is the hardest, or or you can't get a crew out until the last quarter, and then you, it, it's a big rush, and then everything happens all at once. So, so I know this came up in our commission with the 11 miles of um, bike lane delineators that Raymond's got sitting in a warehouse ready to go, right? And, you know, the thought was, oh, we should, every month, you should have 11 divided by six, you know, months or whatever miles. Like, it's not going to go like that, you know. It, it might not get 
the crew's time until September and then it all happened in a week, who knows? So, um, yeah, I, I know that you're not rigidly requiring us that, but you know, it's, it is important to track, I guess, but I don't know that we should hold ourselves to X divided by Y necessarily, you know? Uh, not to say that we shouldn't track it all, we, we should track it, but maybe not rigidly hold ourselves to something. I don't know. Uh, I definitely agree with you, Brett, about about the fits and starts. I know the reality is things don't happen linearly. the The advantage of tracking is is not that we're. I mean, I don't, I don't think the danger is that we've handcuffed ourselves to our targets. I I don't think that's how government actually works. But if we if we miss our targets year after year that then then we have an automatic red light that hey something is happening and we're not we're likely to miss uh the big goal of of a fleshed out network so in my opinion the danger the danger is more that the big goals slip than we unduly handcuff ourselves to year by year targets they'll they'll alert us to when we're underperforming I'm, yeah I'm true I'm a tracking bit... is certainly important. Tracking is important. It's important to know where we are. That that's for sure, annually or quarterly or whatever the metric is. Yeah, agreed. So the, on the spreadsheet that Suzanne has up, it looks like um, what you're asking for, Jonathan, is part of the spreadsheet. Am I am I missing something? What I saw on the spreadsheet was, first of all, three years, uh, three miles a year rather than five miles a year which is in the plan so i which advocated tab? For... jonathan which tab are you on because i'm on the capital improvements tab and i have it highlighted up here build out a safe comfortable bike route install five miles oh, okay all right i might have yeah I'm, do you know what i might maybe yeah i have seen that tab I, I get tripped up by tabs as well so i just wanted to make sure that if i did not send you the right file um the, the title should be moving together strategy tracking and there would be four different tabs in that Excel file. If I, I did see. not send that, please, please let me know. Okay, no, I assume that you did and I probably was not on the right tab. So I do see the five miles, uh, that looks great. Um, uh, let's see, the... the um, well, I guess that more, let's see, the, th the three points that I had listed here that I saw where I felt a mismatch was uh, committing to low stress routes, not just bike markings. Now that might be, again, point uh, on the on the tabs. Yeah, I do have in the, and excuse me, I'm getting over a fairly significant hot cold, so my apologies. Um, we do have that we want to build out a comfortable network of bike routes under the capital improvements tab, complete the all ages and abilities network by 2045. And so I just want to also comment that, you know, the city have been tracking non-motorized improvements. Um, we do have a specific dashboard that's already dedicated to that. We've incorporated that dashboard kind of link within our annual report. We do feel that that is a very important item to mm -hmm. be measuring annually. Now, um, one thing I wasn't able to find in the plan, the All Ages and Abilities Network, how how many miles of bike facilities is it? Do we know that? I don't know. I'd have to probably dig because I don't so have the, So but I, the question is, would, would our five miles a year, uh, would that, is that consistent with completing the network by 2035? My thought is it would be, but now that I see that Cynthia's removed herself from on screen, I bet she is going to look that up for us right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that like the context matters as well. You know, a low low stress network for one particular road, like a neighborhood street, is that may already be conducive for you know an all ages and abilities um, facility versus you know Washington Avenue. Correct. Um, yes. You know, so mm -hmm. yeah, that those contexts I think really matter, and we're trying to prioritize those tier one and tier two corridors first. But knowing that there are other capital uh, improvement projects being made, 
we do incorporate those elements in projects automatically. Um, and then we are, we've been working with all of our project managers on the fourth floor to ensure that they know where those resources are. They know where the map is. They know what the all ages and abilities network is. They know what the different treatment options can be depending on the specific context of the district and kind of neighborhood. So that's been a, a really big effort that Cynthia and I have been undertaking, but I'll talk about that uh, in a couple slides. Cynthia, were you looking up that number by any chance? I I can. I definitely oh, okay. can. But uh, no, my um, my computer decided to stop recognizing my camera for a moment. <laughs> um, Jonathan, I can get back to you on what that projected number is if you would like, and I'd be happy to send that out to everybody just to give sure, like uh, a, a nice ballpark. Yeah, let me just make great. it. I, I, think, I think it would be... The, the, I'm glad to see the five miles a year goal. It's be interesting to see if that, if adding five miles a year is consistent with, with the uh, target in line 15, complete the full ages and abilities network by 2035. I'm making a note of that right now. So the recommended um, all ages and abilities network is listed on page 59 of the plan. It has um, 102 total miles of network. 26 of those are already in place, according to the plan. 28 miles of bike, of existing bike routes need to be enhanced. And 48 miles of new bike routes are needed to meet the plan's recommendations. So that's on pages 59 and 60 of the plan. So the five miles is close. Five miles would give would give us 60 miles. Uh, it sounds like we need something like about 75 new miles or something like that. So, I mean, we could have a little stretch goal and say uh, six miles, because that's six miles per year, because that's what would bring us in the ballpark of, of the, the goal that we set in the plan. Can I make a comment? I, I uh, agree with Jonathan that it's important to measure our progress against the plan. Back around December, I sent around to everybody a spreadsheet, a simple spreadsheet format that would show the, the total goal, the, the uh, progress each year against that plan and the uh, cumulative progress since the start. I don't know if there's been any looking at that. I could put that up here if, uh, if, if you let me. That'd be great, Larry. It's, it's, uh, no, not just the miles of the bike facility, but I dealt with all the things uh, like focus improvements, quick builds, sidewalk gaps, sidewalk gaps in major streets, crosswalks enhanced, crosswalks new, bike routes new or upgrade, intersections for biking, bikeway striping, bike infrastructure conditions, school infrastructure, and bike ped counts. So those were all of the pr principal. Um, construction goals that were in the plan. And then there was, we, there was a target. Some of them had an ultimate target. Some of them had a yearly target. And um, in that kind of format, you could list all the projects and see the progress against that. There could be similar spreadsheets for progress against some of the policies that were in the plan. But as far as the actual construction, this dealt with most of the things. Has that, has that been looked at by staff or, or by anybody else? Well, that's kind of what Sam Schwartz did. <laughs> that's what that's what these four tabs do for us. And well, so I'm waiting for the end of the construction season, which we are well away from that being completed to tracking that. So like you said, everything happens in fits and spurts. And so yeah. we will know through, you know, billings, through invoicing, and then touching base with our project managers what was actually done. And again, the city does have a dashboard system that has a the active construction projects. We already have built in sidewalk gap infills, the biking network, and then we'll use our these spreadsheets um, that Sam Schwartz developed to be doing that on an annual basis. Like that's going to be, you know, more internal facing. And then we'll, you know, we will be kind of picking and choosing, you know, the things that we really want to be reporting out on. 
I don't want to report, you know, all 60 um, strategies in an annual report. Um, I don't think that's appropriate. And I think it's exhausting and overwhelming for the public. And we're really trying to give them bite-sized pieces to show the success that is happening because there's going to be some areas that see greater success in some years. Um, and so that's are going to be moving forward with that strategy tracking. Well, maybe I don't have the spreadsheet you're talking about. The, the one that you have on the screen now, capital improvements, I don't see the um, some of the ultimate goals that were in the plan. Maybe it's something I don't have. Here. Um, I mean, these were all in the back of the plan if we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, these were, but it, but it doesn't have it doesn't have everything that I had on my spreadsheet. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Maybe I don't have. Maybe I can't see the same. Yeah, thing. there may there there may be some other. I know where there can be some some difference. Um, and Larry, if you want to drop that in an email, I'd be happy to share that out with everybody. I'm happy to do that. You know, if there's any other follow up materials, be happy to share that out. Okay, I did send it around before, but I could send it again. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are there and, any? And, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Cynthia. I was just gonna say, Larry. I believe this is the the same email that Suzanne, or this is the same spreadsheet that Suzanne emailed out at the end of last week. So you should have that in your your inbox. I just double checked to make sure that it's the same spreadsheet and that nothing nothing seems to have gotten lost in that in that spreadsheet um, so that is there but I do want to stress that as far as reporting out and for the public to be able to see what's going on and um, for the public to be holding us accountable as well the dashboards have been really really helpful in um, helping helping people understand where we're working and uh, how much progress we've we've made and we've received really good feedback um, on the dashboard views. So this isn't the dashboard. The dashboard is a different item. That's correct. This is the internal. This is what Suzanne is going to be using as she's holding the rest of staff accountable to meeting the plan goals. And um, then there will also be the outward facing reporting through her program annual report and also through the dashboards. And you know, they already exist. We're making some changes to some of them to provide a little bit more information. Um, and we've made some changes over the past year to provide more information. So those, those are, those are the areas where um, the publicly available external reporting, and then this is the spread. These are the spreadsheets that Suzanne will be using as program manager to hold all of us internally accountable. I hope that makes sense. There were existing dashboards um, for tracking a litany of items across the city, especially in engineering. And some of those we're incorporating into our annual report. We're not recreating anything. We're just like, hey, this thing already exists. We're just highlighting it in a different, it's like literally the exact same thing. It's the same map. We made sure on a couple other features just to show where those improvements have happened over time. And, and it shows where improvements will happen over the next few years too. Yeah, very helpful. Yeah, they're mostly map based, so you can see, you know, and they're coded by types of project and everything like that. So uh, I wonder if I could pose my question again. I don't don't want to be too pedantic here, but the five miles a year isn't consistent with our with the goal of completing by 2035. Six would be reasonably consistent. W where did the five come from? And is there any reason why it can't be a number that would actually be consistent with the with the goal of fleshing out the network? We'll turn to Cynthia since I was not on staff when this plan was actually being developed. <laughs> you know, Jonathan, to be honest with you, 
I did not micromanage the development of this five miles per year. We had a consultant and they put that together. Uh, the thing that I am most concerned about is that when we have a project coming up, are we incorporating the plan recommendations in that project? And that's really where I focus my attention. And keep in mind, this plan was approved, I think, at 21, right? So that would be 12 years times five. Now you're at 60. And I mean, we're splitting hairs here. Like I said, it, the opportunities come on a project by project basis. Um, you know, some years, maybe there will have the opportunity to get eight miles, you know, it's, but um, it, it's part of it might be that the plan's already been around for two years now. Are there any additional questions on this topic? Let, let me just mention, I, the, I looked again at the spreadsheet you sent around. It does have most of the goals, but it doesn't have a, I don't see a way of reporting the annual progress and the cumulative progress towards those goals in that spreadsheet. Am I missing something? Well, the cumulative process would be kind of brought up, like I think the, the non-motorized, like the bike facilities, you can see that over like a five or six year period of time. We actually turned it on so you can see all of the projects that have been done. But again, we're going to be focusing on what we do on an annual basis. And Larry, I know that it may not be the way that you want this reported, but I cannot report and I will not report everything in an annual report. Full stop. I'm just not going to. Like, we, we have done that. Eli did that before, and two people clicked on it in five years. And I don't think that that's a valuable use of staff's time or my time to be reporting out every single thing when there's nothing to be reporting out on. I'm happy to take the spreadsheet, but this, this tracking that I'm going to be utilizing is developed by Sam Short so that I can be tracking that internally. And then we will be reporting out on the materials that we find most beneficial to the public that the public is most interested in. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled that you are, you know, a couple of years ago when this, uh, when the plan was approved and we're all very excited about the plan, there is, it seemed like there's a bit of a disconnect between the plan and, and staff and, you know, the day-to-day -day operation. So I'm, I'm uh, very, very happy that you, we have Suzanne to, you know, fill that disconnect between the plan and, and all the people in City Hall. And um, like you keep saying, to, to hold staff accountable, um, not in a bad way, I'm sure. Um, but you know, to just remind people what the the plan goals are, um, I'm really happy to see the you know the very strong link now um, between yourself and uh, between the plan and and everybody else. So I'm I'm looking forward to this going as well as it can. I I certainly have full faith that that staff will do their best. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm looking at time and if. There, are, I'm not sure if there are any other questions, but I will pose that one more time. Lillian, I think I saw you unmuting. I guess what I'm hearing and trying to understand is, uh, is, is the goal symbolic? Is this what we're getting at with the like, we'll make it or we won't make it? It seems to me that I, I do have Larry's email from December um, and maybe it's just how my brain works, but I, I do see I also am not familiar with the dashboards that are available to the public, but I do think I am understanding the kind of metric that's bringing up of like, how do we know from words how close we are to this thing? Um, and what I think I hear Brett saying is that we'll get there, um, but we, I guess I'm just trying to figure out if if it's something that we're actually trying to get to, or if it's more of a symbolic goal. No, we're getting there. That's my job to track all of these strategies. So at the end of the you know calendar year, Trevor and I are going to sit down and I'm going to say, hey, all the stuff that we worked on this past year, who do we need to talk to? Who do we, who, do we not know what's going on? Let's go talk to the project managers. And that is our job to be tracking that. And then I can report. If Raymond requests it, if the public requests it, I'll provide it. I'm just not going to keep a spreadsheet on a website <laughs> that no one is going to use because we've just found that that's not beneficial. But it is being tracked. It is not symbolic. 
these are the stated goals, these are the tracking. Some years will have more than others, but yes, this is all of the areas by which we want to be making progress for the completion of the plan. And I expect the Transportation Commission to be a good spot, you know, as kind of a mediator between what you release to the public and internal, you know, if, um, we'll probably have a, you know, once a year, we'll get the report, the annual report, and probably have an opportunity to discuss it, maybe see the spreadsheet or something like that in the Transportation Commission. So I don't think, I don't expect it to be purely internal, but yeah, it's it's not... Yeah, it's not, it's nothing I'm going to guard. If somebody requests it from a, the member of the public, I'll provide it. I'm, it's not that. I'm just not going to provide it all the time because those updates need to happen on a regular schedule. They need to be done in partnership. And I don't want there to be, well, but you guys just did the sidewalk gap and fill. And why didn't you include this like quarter mile? Like that's really, really hard to be able to micromanage it in that way. And I, I just don't think that's a good practice moving forward. So with Trevor on board, this is the kind of established practice that we're going to be making. Yeah, Cynthia, I think you just wanted to have one final comment on it. Um, actually, I was going to say, I, I just I just want to um, to kind of help this conversation. That was the, the, am I sharing the right thing? No, great. That didn't work. Do you want to be sharing? Because I can stop. Yeah, I do. I want. I okay, want to share sharing. the sidewalk gap. Go with ahead. You. Go ahead. Send me. And... Should be able to screen share now. Okay. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and bring this up. So, for anyone who hasn't seen the sidewalk gap um, prioritization, this is just the one that I grabbed first. Um, as you can see, you know, everything that we're talking about, wanting to make sure that the public can see it, it's here, it's, it's, it's in there, right? So that, and it's a map, you can interact with it, um, and, and see things. So the information that we're talking about is being conveyed to the public just in a different way. That was all. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I am going to move on so that we can. Okay, this is going to work. Sorry. All right. So I'm going to jump over to speed management. And <laughs> I've been a little surprised. We've been trying to garner some interest in a focus group for our speed management program development knowing that we had a lower response when we first kind of rolled out the, like kind of soft launched the program, Raymond and our team thought it'd be best to do some focus group interviews. Um, after a thousand random selected addresses to residents, businesses in the city, we had, yes, you are correct, 19 responses. Um, I believe I'm down to about 15 now because a couple of people have said they can no longer participate. So knowing that we got that lower response, we also pivoted to do some, what I'm calling stakeholder focus groups. So a couple of you may or may not have been invited um, from me on that. So thank you so much for your participation. You'll be getting a confirmation email from me this week. Um, so we'll be looking to hold those um, in-person and virtual based on people's preferences uh, during the month of July. And they will be held, uh, conducted by Smith Group. Um, the city staff will not be performing those so that we have a much more fair and balanced perspective. And yes, <laughs> so it's been um, a very, very small group uh, that has responded. And we will be doing a much larger kind of launch of the speed management program this fall. I'm meeting with Trevor this week uh, to kind of get a game plan together. I'm looking at having at least one open house type meeting in each ward and then hosting a couple virtual um, engagement opportunities as well just to walk through people walk the walk people through the program and um, kind of dispel some myths uh, early on and then those can also help in updating like our frequently asked questions so that the public can really see this as a 
process that they have been kind of involved with and informed and educated on. Any questions on speed management? What are the, what's the information you're going to be uh, gleaning from the focus groups? Uh, the focus groups will um, will ask them to do some homework ahead of time. One would be the overall kind of speed management story map, uh, making sure that people have kind of reviewed that and asking them some targeted questions um, on that specific story map. And then we also have a endorsement tool that we have created. And we really want to get some feedback from folks on its usability, if it was easy, if it was difficult, um, and just try to find out if there's words, phrases, things within all of the kind of online portals that is it too difficult to understand? Are there things that we could explain better or use uh, more plain language? Seth? Is there any broader? Um advertisement or or notification i guess to to the city at large about the existence of this program or is it going to be like suddenly there's a bunch of speed humps somewhere and people are losing their minds <laughs> no <laughs> um so what i want to use the kind of i'm going to call it the now hard launch of the program after the focus groups this fall right. that is going to be a hey, this is part of our Vision Zero implementation. Safety is our you know, most critical concern. These areas, these corridors, these tools, one in each ward, and maybe some targeted postcard mailings to um, I think some of our areas of uh, our equity communities. I think that that would be also an appropriate use of my time and getting that word out so that there's at least that um, initial touch point. And then I'm really thinking about developing a strategy by which we continue to have this conversation for like the next year, um, where we go out once a month somewhere. Maybe we partner with an existing, you know, project or program that's happening and just say, hey, don't forget there is this program. These are the types of projects that you might be, that would be brought forward. What about these upcoming projects? Would we see speed management elements on it? Oh, yes, you probably would because it's on this corridor. These sort of tools would be um, available for the project engineers to utilize. But nothing is going to be like no speed bumps are going on the road without there being even additional public engagement and probably communication separate from this kind of like hard rollout of the program. Okay, great. I've been really disappointed with the response. I thought for sure people would want to do focus groups, but that's okay. <laughs> and then I'm going to turn it over to Cynthia to provide awesome updates on our quick builds. Cynthia. So we're installing quick builds for real. <laughs> Uh, you may have noticed throughout the city that our initial uh, batch of paint and post projects is currently under uh, being, you know, under progress. It's, it's all being installed. Um, I think we have some maybe Ann Street or is it Washington? I can't tell. And then, you know, maybe some Packard. Um, but anyways, the on our website, we do have the full list of projects that are in the current Quick Build program, which includes Packard State, uh, Washington, and Liberty at Stadium, Glen at Fuller, and uh, North Maple, getting some additional bicycle conspicuity on that corridor. So we, we're making progress. Um, they, our pavement marking inspector has been working very diligently with PK contracting to make sure that we can get as much done as possible this fiscal year before the end of the fiscal year. And we're, we're getting those pavement markings in. Uh, but as Seth pointed out, earlier. Sometimes we can't get everybody to line up perfectly. So we are 
um, trailing behind a bit with the delineators and getting the posts in. So there aren't any installed yet, but they are coming. We, have, we do have delineators in stock in there. Uh, or was it Brett? I don't know who said it earlier. Anyway, we're, we're getting, they're on the work plan. They'll be following along and uh, just added bonus project, which is not part of this quick build program is that while OWL has been um, working very hard to make sure that we have PK in town, we were also able to get self-division finished up. So that cycle track has been extended down to Hoover. And just so that you know, we're kind of calling this our quick build 2022 with the images on the screen. Uh, the contractors, when they're there, do very high quality work. Um, they're very, very friendly and obviously eager to be involved in a photo, which I'm always happy for as well. Uh, and really like a huge shout out to Cynthia for helping me really learn about the coordination of this program. Uh, there are a lot of moving pieces that I just had no idea about. And Al, who is our pavement marking whisperer, um, I'm so grateful for all the work that he's been able to accomplish, even just these quick builds. Um, we are gearing up for getting plans developed for quick build 2023. Um, and that's where I believe Brett, you had mentioned that we'll be looking to do some um, buffering, um, some vertical posts uh, in painted buffered bike lanes. I'm working with Cyrus Keedy uh, on that project. So there's there's a lot coming, but it, it does take some time. So I do appreciate everyone's patience. Um, yeah, any questions on quick builds? Last week at our commission meeting, and correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong, Julie, um, there's a public commenter that had some critiques of how what I think is a quick build is going in um, in the downtown area to keep vehicles from parking in the between the no parking and the crosswalk. Um, I haven't been there to see it myself in, in person. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys saw those comments or have any com you know uh, reply to that. Um, again, I don't. I can't say I've seen it. Uh, to understand the issue raised myself, but. Um, so if you look in your slide deck, one of these photos, this is the corner of 4th and Anne. It has some of that um, at this kind of like top gray portion here, but not all of them were designed to reinforce no parking. Um, it was designed to kind of shorten that turn radius of cars and to position pedestrians in a much more um, forward movement so that if people are taking that turn, they can see the pedestrians better. Um, I did see that comment and I believe I talked to Cynthia about this as well and um, kind of confirmed with her what some of those pavement means and kind of the bump outs um, are, are being used for. So for my benefit and um, those who perhaps were not privy to the comment, was this regarding the color? Was was that what this comment was? No, I don't think it was the color. It was a critique of, Julie, do you remember the details? I don't remember the details, but it had to do with, he was like, I can see that you're trying to keep people from parking in this zone, but it's not working. They're parking there anyway. Wasn't that part of it? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I oh, feel sorry. like there's a comment like if you're walking from the other way, it might be making something worse. I, but not, I didn't understand that. Yeah, at all. yeah. There was also so the I think the information that I either provided back to that individual or maybe to Raymond, and I'm trying to remember all the nuance there is. We haven't put the vertical delineators in, so it'd be very difficult for people to kind of cut into these painted spaces once those posts are in, unless they. Um, don't mind driving over bolted down city posts. So like the full deployment is not realized yet. This is kind of the part one. Um, and then that part two, we have to wait until all the pavement markings are down. I confirmed that with Cynthia. 
Um, it's just too disruptive to try to get the guys to kind of paint around them. Um, so that's where we're working through that process right now. Lillian? I don't want to speak for the commenter, so I'm going to make this my own comment, but I did listen to the meeting after the fact and heard that comment. Um, and I think that um, one concern that folks have not having the post up, but in general, of if you see this area that's carved out in the street and you're like, that's no good, but there's still a whole car length behind it that is also no parking, um, does it look like, oh, this is no good because it's painted and delineated, but this area that's not painted is good to go and I can park here, even though that's still in the no parking here to corner area. And I think Raymond had said that's an enforcement job, <laughs> if if memory serves. Um, yeah, and, and this may have been a different comment that came via email to me, but it sounds very similar. And so, you know, we're not adding additional signage. Um, that wasn't the intent of the quick builds. It's really a paint and post program. And so, like, if they're parking in a no parking zone and they get a ticket or they get towed, that's, you know, still... Uh, an enforcement issue, and they should still be mindful of the existing signage that's already there. But it is something that, like, I'm taking back as kind of like comments that maybe if we are going to do something near an intersection, that we could maybe expand that kind of pavement marking and then use some of the city posts to reinforce you are not supposed to park here, um, knowing that that's already becoming a, an issue. So I do think it's a well founded comment that we could potentially adapt for future deployments. And it's something I'm hoping will be, the burden will be eased after the curbside management study um, findings are implemented. Um, you know, I understand that study just finished. Maybe that will, you know, there will be more room for the uh, delivery truck kind of uh, people. It seems to be, you know, at the crux of this issue. Hopefully that will ease, uh, the issue a little bit as well in the future, near future. Thank you. Is there anything further on the quick builds? And thank you for those comments. I made a note of that. No, okay. We are going to go to, I'm actually going to hand things over to Julie as our chair. Sorry for the scrolling. Um, I can tee this up uh, at our April meeting. We discussed. Uh, next steps for the subcommittee. I did provide the memo that I had written for that April meeting. So um, following that conversation, we were to bring this forward again uh, tonight. So Julie. Yeah, so the Transportation Commission, uh, at our last meeting, um, it was raised that, well, this decision of whether we should uh, disband or not is is uh, partly in the hands of the Transportation Commission. We serve at their um, request and the Transportation Commission uh, basically agreed with the conclusion that we had come to that we probably had um, uh, gotten to the point where if this commission continued to, or this subcommittee continued to meet, it would be kind of rehashing some of the same stuff that we were doing in the Transportation Commission. And so it made sense to disband it um, at this time. So um, on behalf of the Transportation Commission, I wanna really thank you all for serving on this committee and um, providing your insights and time and um, I especially appreciate the people who did their homework and purchased, you know, produced extra documents for us to to uh, peruse. I really appreciate your energy and um, you know thoughtfulness on the committee. Yeah, yeah. To add on to that, um, uh, in the time the committee has existed. Um, my confidence in the uh, reality of the plan, uh, or uh, my confidence that the plan would come to fruition has increased a lot. Um, 
and I, I think that's something that would have come in time anyway, but uh, having this close contact with uh, the city staff and other members of the public and, and the, the consultants um, has really, um, I think, focused everyone on ways that we can make sure that this gets implemented and clarify the things that needed clarifying um, and uh, generally built excitement um, and, and commitments to getting to getting this done. So um, again, I'm thankful to everyone here and especially um, staff for supporting this meeting, for planning it, uh, Suzanne for organizing all these and sending out uh, you know, keeping the schedule and, and agendas and everything. Uh, you guys have done, as with everything, uh, city staff continues to uh, impress me greatly. So thank you very much to everyone that's participated. You're here. Thank you very much for those very kind words. And again, thank you very much for everyone's participation as well. And thank you so much for leading us to that discussion. Are there any questions on that topic? It's been a great learning opportunity, so thanks for creating it. Great. And this certainly won't be the last committee, you know, transportation related committee. We even, you know, currently have an, an open question about, sorry, Cynthia, uh, crosswalk design guidelines subcommittee. <laughs> I'm not saying we're, we're doing it, but, you know, um, this is certainly not the last opportunity for members of the public to be really engaged uh, and, and to work closely with city staff. I'm sure this won't be the last we see or hear from all of you. Hopefully okay. not. All right. Uh, moving on to some of our last slides. I just wanted to take a couple minutes. You know, we have been trying to do a, a better job um, of doing some education and outreach. And I really would be remiss if I did not uh, thank two people in the, the room today. One would be Cynthia Redinger. She is like my ID generator. She's like, hey, we should do this thing. And so we're able to do it. Um, you know, thankfully we have a full staff, which really helps. And, you know, Trevor Bryden is fantastic, <laughs> always eager to like hop on board with any ideas that we have to really help deploy. And I really want to give a huge shout out to um, her partnership with the Get Downtown really made for a very successful bike to work day. We had almost 300 like kind of self-reported participants from our stations, uh, 15 or 16 stations that we hosted this year. Um, and it was really, I give a huge amount of credit to those individuals who are here this evening. So thank you both so much. A um, couple of pictures just for you. I uh, just thought this was fun. This is one of our riders at our station on Bike to Work Day, definitely decked out. It was a little cool that morning. So seeing, you know, kids and other people riding, it was really rewarding. Uh, we also hosted a League of American Bicyclists uh, kind of cycling 101 training course. We're looking to host more of those. Uh, we didn't get as many people as we wanted um, this first go around, but had some good feedback on how we can improve kind of uh, turnout. Um, and then we would like to do kind of the second part of that training course, but it is fairly expensive. It's about $500 per person. Um, so that's a little bit of a barrier that we're trying to overcome in the near future. And then for the first time ever, the city participated in the African American Festival, and it was hot. Oh, so hot. However, we were able to hand out over 50 bicycle helmets to youth and adults. We were able to hand out numerous um, bike lights and some safety swag. We had HWPI, Common Cycle there. There was some tune-ups done. And so we're really going to try to have a bigger presence at that festival. It was very well attended. Even with the heat, the music was great, and there was a lot of good food. So I would strongly encourage you to check that out next year. Um, and, you know, Cynthia and I co-chair the Michigan chapter of APBP, which is the Association of Pedestrian bicycle professionals and we are we host like monthly webinars but we're actually opening that up to city staff now um, so that we can get more people you know well versed um, in pedestrian and bicycle planning and the most recent research advice from other communities we are doing a 
uh, bike parking uh, and webinar viewing party in July. If you're interested, let me know. You're welcome to come. Um, we're, we're having one of our members uh, do a presentation on bike parking and then we'll view the webinar. And then we are doing a kind of Detroit ride and learn about all the different efforts that are taking place in September. And then Cynthia, again, an idea from Sredinger, was doing a lunch and learn series on the Vision Zero plan. Mm -hmm. um, we've been, we're hosting those every other month. Uh, we did have to cancel this month because I was very sick and could not talk. But we're really dissecting the plan, giving real world examples of kind of the email communications that we receive, uh, see click fix reports, um, how we can really encourage people to use the plan as the information that they need to respond to the public. And so those have been, I think, pretty well attended. Um, we've received some good comments back on how we can improve those training opportunities. So those are some of the kind of internal and external efforts that we've been undertaking the last couple of months. Question. I just wanted to mention I uh, sent my comments from December and the attached spreadsheet. Uh, I think to everybody in the group for, for what those comments are worth. I just uh, I just sent those out now. So thank you, Larry. For your, it. for your information. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions on education and outreach? Seeing none. Moving to public comment. Cynthia, I'm not sure if there is any member of the public um, this evening, but definitely want to provide an opportunity. Oh, you are muted, Cynthia. We do not have anyone this evening. Okay. I'd, I'd like to change hats now and be a member of the public. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a question about our policy, <clears throat> excuse me, towards left turns. What we heard uh, several meetings ago is that that the pedestrian crashes uh, are dominantly and fail to yield in turning movements with the left being particular the, the more dangerous one than the right. This question comes from a particular near miss that my wife and I were involved with. It, it turned out, uh, well, I contacted MDOT and I, I think the end of the story is reasonably good. Uh, we were walking north on on um, North Main, crossing depot, and uh, with with the pedestrian cross signal, of course, uh, when a car suddenly s swung a left, the car that was headed south on North Main swung a left onto North Depot. I literally pushed my wife out of the path of that car. After I did that, I went to look at the cycles for the intersection, how it was working. And here's what I believe the problem was, and I think MDOT agreed with me. Uh, the, um, there is a flashing left arrow. There's, there's a solid, a solid uh, green arrow, but then there's a, a, a longer cycle of a flashing yellow left arrow. So what we're asking the drivers to do, they're headed down on South Main, note, by the way, they've just come off the freeway, uh, is look for gaps in, in the cars if you're, if you're going to make a left on that flashing ye le yellow left arrow. But then also, of course, look out for pedestrians. Well, it's kind of a recipe for disaster. Uh, because cars don't do that. They're focused on the gaps and when they and when they see a gap, they floor it. And if there's a pedestrian there, even though she's walking with the with a pedestrian signal, she's very vulnerable. MDOT seemed to agree with me and they they said after actually they, they it was they were very, very responsive. This was I think in oh, I don't know, not much more than a week. They said we've looked at it. Uh, we've eliminated the flashing left arrow signal if the pedestrian has pressed the button, which seems to me a very, very sensible policy. Why on earth would we want to put pedestrians in that situation where they believe they're protected by the, uh, by the pedestrian signal? And meanwhile, there's cars, left turners, who are focused on car gaps. It strikes me that this would be a useful policy to implement in the city as well. 
I noted, for example, uh, I, I was I, since this happened, I was keeping uh, keep my uh, keeping my eyes out for places where on city streets it seems to happen. I did notice uh, that in on uh, Jackson and High Lake. So if you're headed west on west on Jackson, uh, there is a a flashing left arrow signal that conflicts with the green with with the walk signal. So the question is, the the policy that MDOT implemented, at least at that intersection, given the vulnerability of pedestrians to left turners, it seems like it would be a desirable policy to implement citywide. And I wonder if, I don't know that, that anybody will be able to answer this right on the spot, but I'd like to see if we can uh, put, put this in the hopper for, for further consideration. So Jonathan, uh, you touched on something that's very important about both of those intersections that you're discussing and thus that they are under the control of the Michigan Department of Transportation. We do not get to set the timing for those locations. When we implement a flashing yellow on city streets, those are implemented at locations where we typically don't have as many pedestrians. We do have actuation. And when we have the actuation by a pedestrian, the flashing arrow does not come up. So that is our standard. Oh, so policy. it's already our policy. Okay, so I didn't realize that, that basically my my address for the for this that second intersection is M dot. Uh, basically, I'll I'll say to M dot, listen, you did the right thing at uh, North Main and Depot. Uh, keep on doing the right thing. Here's another example of where you can do it. And while you're at it, since you've been so successful with them, how about you ask that they put a leading pedestrian interval on all of their signals in the city as well? <laughs> yeah, thank you for for doing that, Jonathan, because yeah, I agree. Um, and I, there, I think there are some flashing yellows. There might be some on here on downtown, but I know a good example of the way city does the city does it um, is at Stadium in Maine, right by the stadium. There, there's never a flashing yellow with a pedestrian walk signal. So I, think, I know at least uh, the city is, I think, doing the smarter thing already. Any additional comments? So seeing none, um, well, everybody, it's been wonderful to get to know you and work with you. And I know it's not the last time we will see each other. I do hope that you will be coming out for our speed management meetings in the fall. Um, and any final comments before we close this Vision Zero Implementation Committee once and for all? I'll just say thank you to everybody for all your work. Really appreciate it. And please feel free to engage with the Transportation Commission in the future. All right, well, thank you everyone. Um, it has been a real pleasure being a part of this team and thank you so much for your participation. Um, this will, all this information will still be um, provided on the Vision Zero implementation page, all the final memos and materials. Um, and if there's ever a question, please be able to reach out to city staff, myself, Cynthia, Raymond, whoever you feel most comfortable with. And have a wonderful evening and enjoy your summer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Suzanne.